Sounds like we had some good conversations in breakout rooms. Um, everyone is back together now, so um, welcome. Just really quickly uh, before we get um, launched in here, we'll go over the agenda. Uh, so today um, we'll be hearing from Todd. Um, a, just a, oh, you know, just a brief introduction into light pollution. Uh, you know, things to consider and. Um, um, so that we're all on the same same page. Uh, we'll have some time for Q and A after after Todd, because he's got a lot a lot in there to share. Um, we are going to take a, a break from our regularly scheduled programming to hear from Candice, um, who's going to share about the Green Core host site uh, opportunity that is open right now um, as well. And then we'll hear from Nick uh, a little bit more about some astro tourism um, happenings that are. Um, taking place in Cook County. And then we'll hear from Kip uh, and the city of Plymouth uh, to learn more about their dark sky ordinance um, as well. So um, again, feel free to use the chat raise hand function um, to, to join in on the conversation, ask your questions, um, share your experiences. And I think with that, I am going to let Todd um, share his screen and we will get started here. All right, let me start sharing that. So good morning, everyone, uh, and, and welcome. So what I'm going to do here is, is kind of three different things. I'm going to start off by kind of defining what we mean when we say light pollution. Light pollution is, is kind of a very broad umbrella term. We'll talk a little bit about what that is and some of the types of light pollution. Uh, then we'll go into some of the impacts of light pollution. We'll talk on uh, seven different impacts, five of them, or six of them negative and one of them positive, which is the astrotourism, the opportunities we, we have uh, to do some astrotourism in the absence of light pollution. And then we'll bring it back to, you know, what, what you uh, city and tribal leaders are interested in, how you can apply uh, dark sky and astrotourism to your areas, how you can help ensure that you're keeping your communities dark, and take advantage of the fact that you have these, these dark communities. Uh, so with that, let's go ahead and get started. I am Todd Burlett. I'm the president of Starry Skies North, which is the Minnesota chapter of the International Dark Sky Association, which started in uh, 1988. One of the first things I often tell people is we're the International Dark Sky Association, not the International Dark ground association. And so the idea with fighting light pollution isn't that we all shut off our lights and go home and sit in the dark in our houses. The idea is that we start to think more, more intentionally about how we're using light, what lights we're using, how we're controlling them, and then uh, making sure that we're not shining a lot of light up into the atmosphere uh, that's going to contribute to that light pollution. And we're also uh, going to talk about some of the, the the great ways that by controlling light pollution, we we do a lot of other positive things in, in our life in terms of, of health, wellness, uh, social and environmental justice, and and so on. So here then are the the seven reasons why I I think each of us should be caring about light pollution. We'll do a little bit of a sampler platter here, so it's going to be a, a little bit of drinking from the fire hose for you for for a while, uh, and then, uh, as Kristen mentioned, we'll open it up to some some questions at the end. So, uh, certainly, energy waste. We'll talk about uh, wasted energy, awe and natural darkness. What being in that nighttime environment can do for us to uh, really enrich our lives wildlife and ecosystems there's there's a vast uh, array of information that we could talk about there we'll hit just a couple of slides on that human health and wellness so so both our physical health and our mental health uh social justice social injustice uh how light can be weaponized uh in in some kind of misguided uh, attempts to to do things like like address crime uh cultural heritage here in minnesota we've got a rich cultural heritage that I think really uh, taps right back into this idea of astro tourism and how we can uh, enjoy not just the stars, uh, but the cultural heritage that, that goes behind uh, uh, that experience of the night sky and then astro tourism, as we talked about. So uh, moving on, what do we mean when we say light pollution? We, we think of light pollution really in, in these four categories and, and starting 
uh, in the upper left and going around uh, clockwise, we've got glare, which is probably the one that we most experience and everyone's most familiar with. Glare occurs anytime your eye is seeing the source of the light. So whether that's the high beam, whether that's an unshielded bulb at home, if you go into your house and take the, the shades off of your, your lamps and you look at that light bulb, that's what glare is. So anytime your eye is seeing the light, instead of seeing what it is that the light is supposed to be illuminating, that's what we mean when we say glare. Light trespass, we've all seen that. We all just kind of grit our teeth and, and move on. So that's that, that neighbor's porch light or garage light that's shining into your bedroom window. It's that, uh, that light uh, on the street from the city uh, that's up on a 40 foot pole shining in the bedroom window. Light that you don't control that is impacting you and, and where you are is, is what we mean when we say light trespass. Probably one of the, the biggest uh, complaints that we get of people grousing about their, their neighbors or, or the lights in their cities. And there, there are some great things that we can do about light trespass, and, and we'll be talking about that. Clutter is a result of, of two things, unshielded lights and the uncontrolled use of, of light. So rather than having a, a light space that is, is well-controlled, well-designed with lighting put in intentionally, it's the haphazard sprinkling of, of lights all over the environment and then uh, not shielding those those lights to the point where you've you've now created so much visual clutter that your brain is is very busy trying to analyze each of those lights and figuring out which of the lights I care about, which of the lights I don't care about, and where's that pedestrian? I'm sure there's a pedestrian here, but which lighted object in there is that pedestrian if I'm driving down the road? So clutter in an attempt to light up our nighttime environment, make us all safer actually has the opposite effect and can put drivers, pedestrians, and, and uh, the public at a greater risk. Sky glow then in the upper right-hand corner, that's the sum total of all of the, the wasted light that we are creating. So that light that's coming from these unshielded bulbs that are shining up, uh, light reflecting off of the ground from bulbs that are just brighter than, than they need to be, that all contributes to sky glow. I know for a fact, uh, I live down here in, in the metro area, the Twin Cities. Uh, I have to drive 150 miles north of Minneapolis in order to get away from the sky glow, that light dome uh, from Minneapolis. And we'll see some examples of how even smaller cities uh, can contribute to uh, sky glow. This is the United States at night. As, as seen from, from satellites. This is a, a 2015 image. So this is going on a 10 year old image. Uh, and you can see the Eastern half of the United States, east of the Mississippi River is almost completely light polluted. So those, those whites and oranges and yellows are where there, there's an extreme amount of light pollution to the point where you're really getting degraded skies if you try and go out and, and look at them at, at night. Uh, and then the darker areas are, are those grays and those, those blacks. When this satellite image was constructed, there were three places left in the Eastern United States that still had pristine darkness. They were uh, up here in, in central Maine, there's a little area. Uh, can you folks see my, my cursor by the way? Okay, great. There's a little spot up here in, in the Kiwada Peninsula, right at the very tip of that, up past Co Copper Harbor. And the world's or the nation's largest dark sky location east of the Mississippi is right here in northern Minnesota. So in, in the Boundary Waters area, uh, that area up around the, the Red Lakes, we have uh, the largest tracts of remaining pristine dark skies anywhere in the United States east of the Mississippi River. And, and we'll talk about uh, how that can be a, an economic uh, opportunity uh, going forward. All right, so a couple factoids, some, some grim statistics. This is the, the state of the world at, at night as, as we currently see it. As you can probably tell from that, that last image, 99% of Americans live under light pollution. There are some nice dark areas, especially in the Western half of the United States, but guess what? They're dark because no one's there. So the places where people live are almost entirely uh, light polluted to, to some level or not. In urban cores, such as downtown Minneapolis, we're seeing only 10% of, of the stars, uh, in some cases closer to 5% of, of the stars uh, that are actually in the nighttime sky. 
And I always challenge people to think about uh, what if we only had 10% of our lakes left in Minnesota? What if instead of the land of 10,000 lakes, we were the land of 1,000 lakes? And the land of, of 1,000 lakes, I had to look this up, is Nebraska. So think if, if we got rid of 90% of our lakes and now all we've got is the number of lakes that Nebraska has. That's the, the level of, of impact that we are having on our nighttime sky with losing so many of the, those stars. Uh, the Milky Way it, itself, only one in five Americans can see the, the Milky Way. Uh, many of you joining on this call that are maybe from uh, outstate areas uh, are wondering what the heck I'm talking about. You can go out any night of, of the year that's, that's clear and, and doesn't have the full moon and you can see the Milky Way. For you, it's a very common experience. There are people in the Twin Cities metro area that have never seen the Milky Way and in fact believe that it's not possible for humans to see the Milky Way. Uh, they've never had that opportunity to get out and observe that uh, natural night sky. Scientists used to think that light pollution was growing at about 2% a year. We, we thought that that was an underestimate. The problem was that satellite that I, I showed you, that image from that, those satellites are blind to the blue end of the spectrum where a lot of our LEDs are now pumping a lot of blue, bright, white light. And so the scientists could only see a 2% growth. Uh, the Great Citizen Science Program, the, the Globe at Night has been out there running uh, for quite a few years now. Two months ago in the magazine Science, the, the the, the research article, Science, uh, put out uh, uh, just a, a wonderful result of 10 years of uh, Globe at Night results that uh, a group of scientists studied. And they found that, no, it's not just that 2% growth that the scientists can see at night, it's actually 10%. Every year, our skies get 10% brighter. You apply the rule of, of 72 from economics, that tells us we're doubling the brightness of the night sky every, every seven years. So. Uh, people like, like me that have been around for more decades than I care to ad admit, the skies are, are now eight times brighter uh, than, than they were in, in the past, 16 times brighter. Uh, and of course, we are the North Star State. It, it's, it's right on our, our seal. And increasingly down here in the cities, you can't even see the North Star. So uh, that's kind of the, the grim statistics, the, the factoids that, that you can take and, and share in, in your uh, your elevator conversations uh, with friends and family and colleagues. So zooming in a little bit, coming back to that, that satellite data, uh, this is what Minnesota looks like zoomed in a, a little bit. I talked about these beautiful, pristine areas uh, up in northern Minnesota. Uh, these, these blue areas are also areas that are, are still dark enough to support good astrotourism economic activity. Uh, they're not as dark as some of these areas in northern Minnesota, but if you're thinking about uh, instituting some astrotourism opportunities in your region, in your community, uh, that is, is certainly something you, you could pursue. Uh, as we get into the, those yellows, oranges, and, and whites, uh, a little bit less so. We have, uh, moving to the, the right side of the screen now, we have in our own backyard three world-class dark sky sites, as, as I mentioned. So the International Dark Sky Association launched uh, about 15 years ago the International Dark Sky Places Initiative, where we recognize and reward and work to protect some of the darkest remaining spots on the earth. We're fortunate here in Minnesota that we've got three of them in our backyard, the Boundary Waters Canoe Area, Voyagers National Park, and uh, just across the border, our neighbors to the north, Quetico Provincial Park are all International Dark Sky Places. But beyond that, Boundary Waters Canoe Area is actually the world's largest international dark sky sanctuary. And that term sanctuary is reserved for the darkest places left on Earth, so the most protected. So the Boundary Waters Canoe Area is not just a world-class dark sky site, it's a world-leading dark sky site. It's the world's largest sanctuary and I, I think that provides a, a great economic uh, opportunity for uh, those gateway communities and really for the rest of Minnesota to really highlight Minnesota as a place where people can come from around the world, around the nation to come in and experience those natural night skies. Okay, we talked a little bit about sky glow. 
Uh, this is what it looks like from Leech Lake. Uh, Leech Lake's uh, about an hour east of Bemidji, if you're not really familiar where that is. So kind of uh, centered in, in the state east-west wise, a uh, little bit north of, of Duluth. And, and the point of this slide is really pointing out how far away you can see the, the sky domes. And uh, also on, on the left-hand side over there, that's one, that's one cabin's yard light from 1.6 miles away. Uh, and for me, this really drives home that this point of we're all in this together. When I'm leaving that porch light on, when my city has got some unshielded lights, that's not just affecting me. It's not just affecting my neighbor. It's affecting people that are dozens of, of miles away. So uh, we're all going to do better when we all do better. And we all have a role to play in protecting each other's nighttime skies. OK, so. Uh, Little bit of geeky stuff, but this is going to help inform our conversation going forward. Not too geeky. Uh, so you'll hear me talk about uh, the term color temperature. You're probably familiar with this. When you stick an iron in the fire and it gets red hot, the color that that uh, piece of iron is, is emitting is determined directly from how hot that iron is. So red hot, for example, is somewhere down here. The color of, of candlelight is about 1800 Kelvin. Uh, Kelvin's just like the Celsius scale, only shifted a, a little bit. And then if you left that iron in and it got hotter and hotter and hotter, it would become yellow hot and then white hot and then finally blue hot. So that's what we mean by the term color temperature. We'll come back a, a little bit more and talk about what I've got uh, really highlighted here in, in red is 3000 Kelvin. In 2016, the American Medical Association looked at the, the sum total of all the research that was out there on human impacts from uh, high Kelvin temperature lights at night, so these blue-white lights. And the preponderance of evidence was so strong that they issued a recommendation to cities, specific, this is specifically for street lights, that street lights should be no hotter, no, have no higher Kelvin temperature than 3000 Kelvin. And that's to protect both our human health and our human wellness. And we'll see how that spills over uh, to the rest of the, the ecosystem. Uh, some of these higher temperatures up here, you can go out to uh, any hardware store, any big box store, and you can buy a bulb that's at 5000, 6000 Kelvin. Uh, that really doesn't uh, do any more in terms of, of helping you see better at, at night, but it really does a lot in terms of, of impacting your, your health. All right, uh, and, and so this is kind of a, a busy slide. I'm, I'm gonna direct you to a, a couple of things here. This is color spectrum. So this is if you shown light through a prism and then spread it all out and look to see where there was, was different amounts of energy. If we look on, on this image way over on, on the right, this is what our natural environment looks like outside daylight at noon. So this is the light coming from the sun and you can see uh, we've got some red, we've got some yellow, and we've got some, some blue. Now we're going to shift over to this one in, in the middle. And this is what our natural light looks like at sunset. And what's happened if you compare the two? The red's about the same. Uh, the yellow has dropped off and, and the blue has plummeted. So that says the sun is starting to set. It's looking more red and the sky is starting to get darker. This is the natural diurnal rhythm, this day-night cycle that humans and all life evolved under. Bright blue skies during the day, increasing uh, redness at, at night as the blue starts to go out. And over evolutionary time, we and other creatures evolved the use of, in, in the case of humans and all vertebrates, melatonin that really tells us it's, it's time to settle in for the night and uh, get ready for the next day. So we're going to have some things going on in our cell cellular biology that are mediated by melatonin that are really going to uh, send out the cleaning crew, uh, get that cellular debris out of our bodies, prepare us for, for that next day. And that's all fine and good. And, and that also worked just fine when uh, we worked under incandescent bulbs, so thermal-based lighting sources. So if you look at those sunset colors, uh, that, that graph down here, and you compare that to the incandescent bulb, it looks pretty similar. It's got a lot of red, not much blue, and no real problem there. Where the problem came in is when we started to use non-thermal sources for lighting. So things that give us light, 
uh, without having to be very hot. So uh, CSL, CFLs and, and of course these days, a lot of LEDs. And with the LEDs, you can have a, a lot of control in terms of where your light is coming from, what part of the spectrum your light is coming from. And that's what we see over here on, under this 4,000 Kelvin light. You can see uh, there's a lot of light in, in the yellow part of the spectrum, not a real problem there. But where we run into trouble, and this is what all the kerfuffle of, is about, is all of the energy in the blue part of the spectrum. This part of the spectrum is the part that our bodies evolved to use to tell us that it's, it's either daytime or it's nighttime. And this bulb is screaming at our brains and saying, wake up, it's time to get going, shut down the melatonin, and off you go out, out the door. When in fact, what we're trying to do is settle in for the night, get our bodies ready for, for recovery and, and ready for the next day. You compare that to uh, the second one over here, this 3000 Kelvin bulb. And this is, uh, you'll see there's some blue light here, but it's a lot less than, than what's happening over, over here. And that's what the kerfuffle is, is all about, getting away from those blue intense 4000 Kelvin bulbs and, and sticking with 3000 or, or even uh, cooler bulbs. Okay, so that's it for the geekiness. Uh, Human health and wellness, we, we've already talked about this a little bit. Uh, and, and just to reiterate the, the point, melatonin is, is really that, that hormone, it's that master hormone that is telling a lot of systems throughout our body that it's time to rest and, and recover. We're gonna go out and we're gonna get that lactic acid out of the muscles. We're gonna do some DNA repair for the cells that were damaged uh, during the day. And the, the brain is going to do all of those things that it does at night, going to deep sleep, uh, to consolidate memories, we're going to have some REM. All of that is is happening overnight, preparing our, our body for for the next day. And the problem is, if that doesn't happen, you, you get two problems. One, of course, is, is the short term. If you if you didn't sleep well uh, last night, we all know we're going to have a pretty crappy day, right? You're going to just be in brain fog. You're just going to be dragging all day. Uh, but the bigger issue is what happens when that becomes a chronic condition. If you're consistently night after night uh, for, for years and decades exposed to those, those blue lights, a whole raft of uh, health conditions start to emerge. And these have been well studied with uh, peer reviewed published research for, for many decades. So uh, the breast and prostate cancers, uh, colorectal pancreatic cancers, uh, obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease uh, are all human health issues, wellness issues are anxiety, depression, and of course that, that brain fog that, that we feel. So uh, th these, are, these are not small things to be trifled with. Um, th these are really, I think of them as uh, ecological pollutants, just like you would think of secondhand smoke as being something that's going to increase your, your risk of cancer. Bright blue light at night is in that same category. It's an ecological pollutant that over time is going to increase your, your risk of all of these, these health impacts. Okay, ecosystems, uh, birds and bats and walleyes, oh, oh my. So as, as I mentioned, a uh, lot, of, lot of biology out there, vertebrate biology is driven uh, by that same melatonin uh, system that we have in our bodies. Uh, so they're going to have those same health impacts. They're not going to sleep well at night if they're uh, exposed to that blue light. Uh, but beyond that, there, there's also what's going on with birds. And I love to talk about birds because who doesn't like birds, right? Uh, so uh, we'll talk about birds, but you could you'd extend this to, to really anything that, that swims or, or, or crawls. Uh, the Audubon Society has done a great job of, of highlighting the impacts to, to birds. They've talked about their, their lights out program, keep the birds from flying into those high rises at night. Uh, so a lot of people are familiar with that. Uh, I gotta tell you, that's just the tip of the iceberg because uh, not only are the birds flying in, into the tall buildings, they're actually experiencing what's called entrapment. So most of our songbirds migrate at night for a number of reasons. And that's all fine and good until they get into a brightly lit urban core. And what happens then is they, they lose their nighttime vision and they're not willing to go back out into the dark environment once they're in that bright environment. And they will spend the rest of the night flying around in circles around that urban core, unable to continue on their migratory route either to or, or from their, their summer nesting sites. 
So they're exhausting themselves. Uh, they're burning through all of their calorie stores and they're less likely to get to where they're going. Once they do get there, now they, they've got a darned if you do, darned if you don't decision to make because they don't like bright light at night any more than we do. And if they do uh, end up roosting somewhere that's bright at night, then here come all of those melatonin mediated impacts. If they want to avoid that bright light at night, now they've got to decide whether they give up that uh, possibly prime feeding uh, and shelter location that may be brightly lit and settle for something that is, is their second or, or third choice that maybe has less access to food, uh, provides a little bit less shelter, uh, but is a little bit darker for them. So they are, are making suboptimal choices in terms of, of where they're going to live, where they're gonna raise their, their young. And that has, a, of course, a ripple effect in terms of how many chicks they're, they're laying, their ability to really propagate their species and be successful in, in their environment. Uh, we talked a little bit about the, the birds that, that know when nesting scenario. Uh, bats are kind of interesting, just very briefly. These, of course, are a flying mammal. Uh, bats in Minnesota kind of fall into two categories, the bats that don't mind light at night and the bats that do mind light at night. The bats that don't mind light at night are having a feast because what happens to insects at, at night, of course, they're all attracted to the, these light sources. We've all seen the, the insects swirling around the street lights. For the bats that don't mind that, that's just ringing the, the dinner bell and they're actually doing very well, uh, but they're over predating the insects because it's so easy. They just fly in and, and eat all they want. The bat species that don't like light are left in those dark areas and they're going hungry because there's no insects because all of the insects went over to, to the light. So you've got uh, in the short term, a dichotomy between bats that are doing well and bats that are really struggling. But in the longer term, as the, those bats over predate the, the insects, and some of you have heard of the insect apocalypse, this is one contributing factor, not the only factor. Uh, eventually all the bats are going to suffer because there's just not going to be enough uh, insects left to, to feed any of them. And then I always challenge people to think about, well, what if you're a firefly? Fireflies, of course, use, use light to signal uh, mates, uh, signal territory. Uh, what if the dark environment, the nighttime environment, uh, no longer allows your light signal to be seen. So um, it's, it's insects, it's, it's bats, it's, it's birds, uh, and it's fish and amphibians. So we all love fish in, in Minnesota. We've got our land at 10,000 lakes. Guess what? Those, those lakes are under threat because one of the things that, that happens with water is as these bright lights are shining on an aquatic environment, two things happen. You're giving more light energy to the algae in the water and they're actually doing better. And the zooplankton, the, the little uh, tiny microscopic animals that eat algae don't like light. So during the day they sink in the water column, they go down to the bottom and, and hang out. And then at night they come up and feed on the algae and they keep that algae in balance. In uh, the presence of light pollution, those zooplankton aren't going to come up and eat the algae. So you've got algae that are, are growing better and being less predated upon, that's leading to algae blooms. Uh, and then for, for the fish, whether we're talking about bass or we're talking about walleye or we're talking about salmon, they're all struggling for, for various reasons. Bass uh, spend the night awake in uh, a fight or flight type of mode. They've got a lot of cortisol that, that's going. And so they're, they're spending the night rather than resting and recovering to prepare for going out and uh, foraging the, the next day. Uh, they're spending the, the night swimming in circles, stressed out and, and again, burning through all that energy. Uh, salmon and walleye, so similar things going on there with the walleye. The, the problem is the prey can see the walleye coming. Uh, and so the walleye are having to work harder, again, expending more energy. So water quality, fish, amphibians, birds, so, so very briefly, the ecosystems, uh, the food webs being disrupted, uh, the hormone and endocrine systems are being disrupted. We're breaking predator prey relationships um, really across the, the board. Every aspect of, of living for, for these creatures, whether they, they fly, they walk or they swim are being impacted by, by light pollution. Okay, very briefly, uh, energy and, and climate change. 
So I've mentioned uh, several times about the, this wasted light. And you think about this, if you've got a light that's shining light in all directions, that light that's shining up isn't doing anybody any good. Instead, if, if you put a shield on that and shone that light down, you could get away with a smaller bulb because now all of the light from that bulb is going to good use. It's going on the ground where we want it to light things up and it's not going, going to waste. Uh, across the United States, we waste 35% of, of our lighting energy. And if we could uh, recover that by making better decisions of, about putting timers and shields and motion detectors on our lights and not over lighting the environment, putting in only the, the light that we need to do the job, we could save uh, $3 billion in the United States a year or $10 for every man, woman, and child. So whether you're talking about your own household pocketbook, paying your electric bill, or what your city is having to pay uh, its electric bill, there's there's great savings to be had there. If all of that electricity is, is coming from fossil fuel sources, we would have to plant 600 million trees a year just to make up for it for the wasted light. So uh, if we're thinking about wanting to uh, get to, to 2040 carbon neutral, here's one small piece of, of how we can do that just by making smarter decisions about how, how we light our environment. Here, here's a great example of what happens when you overlight the environment. So this is just a, a smattering of, of newspapers. You, you can see on the right hand side where these newspapers were, were from. And across the board, across the country, what we keep finding is cities get it wrong when they when they try to upgrade their, their lighting. They're putting in lights that are too bright, that are too blue, not well shielded. And some of what's happening is what we call the rebound effect. A, a nice LED light uses about a quarter of the electricity of a high pressure sodium light. So, so cities look at that and they say, hey, we can uh, save 75% on our electric bill by moving from high pressure sodium to LED. Well, that's great. But then they start to think, hey, you know what? We could give back some of that savings by putting in a few extra lights and we could still save half on our electric bill and we overlight the environment and you know, cities pat themselves on the back and say, hey, way to go. We cut our electric bill in half. When of course, what they did is they left a lot of uh, opportunity on the, the table. They, they added light when there was really no need to add light and ended up giving back on, the, on those savings. And in some cases, uh, Seattle in, in particular, it got so bad that they had to do a redo. The city had to go in and pay to take those bulbs out and go in and put in bulbs that were more acceptable to the public. So uh, let's learn a lesson from uh, the, these bad examples and get it right the first time. Okay, safety, we, we often hear about this. It's like, well, bright light at night keeps me safer. Uh, gosh, wouldn't that, wouldn't we all love it if that were true, if we could all just flip a switch and ta-da, we're all safe. We could lay off our police forces and, and bright light keeps us safe. And, and so we can all go wander the streets at, at night. Um, and, and that's not actually, actually the, the case. Um, and, and so when we think about safety, uh, we, we really lump it into a couple of different categories. We talk about roadway safety, so that's driver and pedestrian safety. And then we talk about personal safety and, and property safety. So roadway safety, we I alluded to this uh, a little bit earlier about that visual clutter, having poorly shielded lights uh, that add a lot of clutter or a result in, in what we call a very low contrast environment can actually decrease safety. Study after study have, have shown that it's not how bright your street is, but how you're able to light your, your external lightscape at, at night, such that you're providing good contrast between the things that uh, you want to see, such as your pedestrian, and the things you don't care about, like the roadway surface. Uh, there have been studies, uh, Virginia uh, Traffic Tech looked at this and found that you could reduce the, the lighting of streets down to 25% of, of standard and not reduce the visual uh, sighting distance, the detection distance of an object such as a pedestrian, provided what you did is you lit that environment so that you're enhancing the, the contrast of, of that pedestrian. So brighter isn't better, 
better is better. How are you uh, intentionally using those lights, shielding those lights, putting them where they belong, not putting them where they don't belong? That's how, how you're really going to enhance roadway safety. Uh, personal safety, uh, again, yeah, that would be great. Uh, no one likes feeling unsafe at, at night. Light can help us feel safer. There's no scientific consensus that it actually makes us safer. And, and that's unfortunate. We would all love that if, if we could, again, just solve that problem by flipping a switch. You can find good studies that say it helps. You can find good studies that say it doesn't help. Uh, the, the, the takeaway from the scientific community is it kind of depends and, and really not, not really. Uh, one of the things that, that happens is, again, you get that false sense of security you think you're safer and you can actually put yourself at risk. The other thing that happens is, is what we call veiling luminance. So uh, this idea that um, over bright light can actually reduce your ability to see. The, the human eye is amazing. It can see uh, a brightness range from the brightest thing it can safely see to the dimmest thing it can safe, can, that it can detect, <clears throat> excuse me, of 100 million but it can only see a brightness range of about 1000 at any given time. So what happens, and, and this is what this image is, is illustrating, if you've got something that's very bright and unshielded light, your eye is going to adapt to how bright that, that light is and things that it otherwise would have been able to detect are going to dim into invisibility. So by having this unshielded bulb, that, uh, that evil doer that you can see there in, in the gate on the right, fades into the background because you, your eye has just uh, adjusted itself upward. You turn around and this is what's being shown on the right hand side, you, you put in that, that shield. Now your eye can adapt to that darker environment. And now that person, I guarantee he's still in that left hand image, uh, that person now uh, can reappear. So this veiling luminance uh, that really is an outgrowth of uh, poorly shielded lights. Social justice, very briefly, some of you may be familiar with this omnipresence program that was launched a number of years ago in New York City. They brought all of these uh, diesel powered uh, light towers into the, the projects to try and address crime. You can find a study out there that says they cut crime by two thirds. Um, what that study doesn't tell you is a couple of things. One is the study was paid for by the same people that put the lights up. So they uh, are, shall we say, a little bit biased. Uh, and they didn't take into effect the, the, the fact that uh, these light towers were accompanied by increased police presence. And of course, these were diesel powered, so they're loud, they're, they're very smelly. And what actually happened is they, they drove people off of the streets. So there, there are, are no criminals left to commit the crimes and, and there's no one on the streets left to commit the crimes. So everyone is, is inside uh, trying to put on, in, in some cases, two layers of blackout curtains so that they could, could sleep at, at night. And, and I thought that, that this was a, a great statement here. Uh, residents have noted that in their experience, the tower lighting didn't deter shooting and getting robbed. The lights just dispersed the community. So it didn't actually solve anything and it actually decreased the, the quality of, of, of life of, of the folks out there. Cultural heritage, absolutely. Again, we've got this, this rich history, cultural heritage uh, in the United States and really around the world. Throughout history and, and prehistory, that's where uh, cultures put the most important stories that they pass down from generation to generation. That's where we put our, our heroes, our villains, our monsters, and that's where we put our, our stories of right living. And then also, of course, we used it for things like navigation and time telling, knowing when to, to reap and harvest, whether we're talking the Egyptians using the, the rising of, of Sirius, whether we're talking the, the Dine or, or the Navajo in, in the Southwest, using the Pleiades to, to know when, when to plant. And all of these rich cultural connections are starting to, to break and, and fray. And you think about uh, on the right hand side there, that that's kind of a, a fanciful idea of what Van Gogh might paint if, if he were to go out and paint uh, Starry Night uh, today. Of course, those beautiful swirling stars are now re replaced by a bunch of sky glow and, and glare. Uh, so you think about all of the people that aren't going to be inspired by the night sky, you know, lovers, poets, uh, scientists, composers, on and on that aren't going to be inspired. 
Uh, and of course, we, we do have a rich cultural history. I don't know if these are going to show up very well on, on your screen. I know they're a little dark, uh, but this is a great example of, of how when we look up in the sky with, with our, our Western constellations, we see Ursa Major and, and the Big Dipper, um, and, and that's, that's fine and good. Uh, but every culture around the world had its own stories, its own critters. The Ojibwe had the, the fisher, and there are wonderful stories about how, how the fisher uh, freed all of the other critters that uh, had been trapped by ogres. The Inuits had, uh, instead of uh, Ursa Major, they, they had a caribou. Uh, the Norse, a uh, little bit of sexual bias here. The Big Dipper was the man's cart. The Little Dipper was the woman's cart. And so this is, is really just illustrating the point that uh, we, we've got around the world rich cultural heritage based on, on the, the night sky and we're losing that. And of course, uh, we all love to go out and, and look at the pictures, uh, you know, see these. This is some place that I did have to get out of the cities to get the, these images uh, because yes, as, as was mentioned earlier, uh, it's a little bit of luck in terms of when the, the sun is active, but absolutely you've got to get to someplace dark. You cannot see the Aurora from downtown Minneapolis. I don't care what kind of a storm that there is going on. But studies have shown that it, it's not just, you know, oh, cool, look at that. Um, there's a lot of good, uh, from from a stand standpoint of, of human wellness from from emotional health social positivity altruism connectedness all go up in, in the, when we're experiencing awe and uh, it, it reduces stress boosts creativity I, I tell you when I go out after a stressful day and I can just sit underneath the, the stars that's when I feel like I can breathe you can take that deep breath the world slows down a little bit and that's just good for everybody's mental health and it leads to more ethical and generous behavior so there are very positive societal benefits to experiencing awe such as the awe that we can all see in, in the night sky and then astro tourism of, of course um as I alluded to earlier, we have world leading world class dark skies in uh, northern Minnesota and really good dark skies really scattered across the rest of the, the state. And let's take advantage of that both as a, as a state and uh, you folks individually, whether you're, you're representing tribes or cities. Uh, getting, getting out and advertising yourself as a dark sky destination. A border class one, we didn't talk about that, but that just means it's as, as dark as it gets. We are, of, of course, due south of the North Magnetic Pole, which means that within the lower 48 states, we have the front seat to the, the aurora. The auroral oval dips further south right over Minnesota. So we get better aurora than North Dakota does, than, than Monta Montana, those other northern tier states. We actually have better aurora here than they do. Uh, so let's again take advantage of, of that. And of course, we've got iconic uh, cultural and natural uh, attractions. We, we've got uh, a culture where a lot of us like to get out and, and enjoy uh, Minnesota. Everyone from the cities drives up north every weekend. So we've already got that culturally going on where people are going out and seeing that environment. Let's get them introduced to the idea of also uh, enjoying and taking advantage of what our state has to offer at night. And, and the best thing about this is the best time to go out and do astro tourism are during those shoulder seasons that that spring and those fall time periods uh where it's it's usually a little bit more difficult to fill those hotel rooms to fill those, those restaurants because those are the times of year when the sun is setting early enough that you can get out take the kids let them see a full dark sky without having to wait up until midnight the the temperatures are still mild the insects are, are gone so that's a great a uh, way to fill in, level out uh, the, the tourism uh, levels that you're bringing up to, to your part of the, the state by taking advantage of astro tourism. Uh, here are some common types of astro tourism, and it can be anything. This is just going out and sitting underneath the stars. Astrophotography, the state's full of astrophotographers. Uh, scientists, whether we're talking about the archaeo astronomers that are, are studying the, the Indian pictographs up in, in the boundary waters. Uh, of course, we've got event specific things going on, such as the aurora, eclipses, occultations. That's when the, the moon is covering uh, something else like, like Mars, like it's going to do at the end of the month here. And then, of course, all of the wellness benefits. So if you're thinking about exploring astro tourism, 
there's a, a wide range of, of ways that, that you can present astrotourism to potential customers. And, it, and it's growing very fast. I'm not going to steal any Nick's thunder. He's got some amazing uh, information to share about what's going on up in Cook County. Voyagers National Park is on board. Uh, Glendalow Park in uh, north central Minnesota. Uh, we've just started talking about them, about becoming Minnesota's third international dark sky place. Forestville State Park down in the southern part of the, the state. And uh, there's competition right now. States around us, uh, Michigan, North Dakota, South Dakota, if you go out and look at what their state tourism boards are doing, go out to their websites, they are crowing about their, uh, their dark sky, their astro tourism opportunities. So let's, uh, let's step it up, Minnesota. I, I think there, there's a lot that we can do there. Uh, so what can we do from international? Uh, so you know, bringing th this back to your community, how can you take advantage of, of this? I've mentioned a couple of times the International Dark Sky Places Program. The IDA has its uh, International Dark Sky Community Program. And we're going to hear a little bit later about what Plymouth has been doing in terms of its lighting ordinance. If you dial up those lighting ordinances to, to a high enough level and your community is dark enough, you can get certified by the IDA as an international dark sky community, which is going to let you crow about that on, on your website, on, on your tourism brochures, that you are a place where people can come and they know they're going to find the dark skies. Uh, the community values those dark skies and is going to cater to a, a dark sky astro tourist. Uh, so we can take that offline and, and talk about what an international dark sky community uh, means for you. So I, I've, I've talked a couple of times about some of these things. This is really boiling it down to what, what is Todd talking about when he's talking about how we prevent and, and avoid light pollution. It really comes down to these five principles. The first one is just, does that light serve a purpose? Did someone put in a light just because there's always been a light there or because they thought it was a good idea and they, they really didn't think about the design of that? Think about whether that light serves a purpose. If not, turn it off, put it on a dimmer, put it on a timer, targeted. This idea of, of putting it on a, a shield, putting the light where it belongs. So keeping it out, of not just keeping it out of the night sky, but keeping it out of people's first and second story windows, putting it on that street, not in people's front yards. Low light levels. I tell people, think of light as a, a tool. And like any tool, you, you want the right size tool. Uh, sledgehammers are great for breaking down concrete walls. Not so good for hanging that, that picture on, on your bedroom wall. So think about how much light you need for the job you're using that, that light for and right sizing the, the light. And then con controlling it, putting it on timers, putting it on a motion detector, whether you're talking about that light on your front porch or those street lights. Think uh, intentionally about how bright that street needs to be at 3 a.m. versus how bright it needed to be during evening rush hour. And then color, we, we talked early on about that 4,000 Kelvin versus that 3,000 Kelvin. Keep those color temperatures low. It's better for our human health. It's better for uh, ecosystem health. And then uh, this is something that, that rolled out just last year. It's called the ROLAN Manifesto for Lighting Professionals. ROLAN is Responsible Outdoor Lighting at Night. And this was developed, and, and I, I really value this, it was developed uh, jointly by not just the International Dark Sky Association, but by all of these professional lighting organizations that, that you see listed there and, and around the side. So these are the industry, the, the leading organizations, professional organizations within the industry standing up and saying, we need to do a better job about how we think about lighting our outdoor environments at, at night. Uh, so as you go back to your cities and, and you're talking to your, your staff, you've got these lighting professionals either that you're contracting with or that are maybe on, on your city staff, your tribal staff, uh, Ask them if they're familiar with these, these Roland standards, and if not, how they can get familiar with them. There is going to be some training that, that rolls out from the IDA in, in the next year. Um, and here are the, the core principles. I, I know we're short on time, so we're not going to go through all of these. But what it really boils down to is making sure that uh, your lighting professionals are thinking intentionally about how they're going to light that environment, how they're going to use light, how they're going to use darkness, and then making sure that they are engaging their community 
uh, whether it's individuals or the community leaders as active stakeholders in how that outdoor light is, is going to be uh, used. And then uh, things that are just best practices such as uh, circular economies, going back out uh, and, and looking at their work, how that was implemented that night, making sure that uh, that lightscape that, that they envisioned is actually what, what got implemented. Green Step, so we're, we're here talking about Green Step uh, cities and, and dark skies. So as some of you are probably aware, there are 29 best practices within the Green Step program. Fully 12 of them have one or more activities that relate directly back to the dark skies. So think about that. Nearly half of the best practices in the Green Step Cities program relate to dark skies. Uh, best practice number four, their efficient outdoor lighting and signals. Uh, that's that's kind of the poster child, if you will. That's where uh, it, it's very much focused on outdoor lighting at, at night. But there are 11 others that have one or more aspects of uh, following a best practice with some of these initiatives that do relate to uh, light pollution in one form or another and, and those energy savings, those health improvements. Excuse me. Um, so coming into the home stretch, and I apologize, we're a little bit over. What does responsible lighting at night look like? Here's a great example, side by side, two restaurants. They're both lit up very well. You can see that restaurant. One has got those glary unshielded lights. Uh, the other obviously has nicely shielded lights and, and you can still see well in, in that environment. On the bot bottom half there, that's the same street. Those are on, on the left, that's before a retrofit with those unshielded lights. On the right, that's after the retrofit. And take a look at, at the ground. Look at on the left-hand side, that intense difference between how bright it is right below the street lights and how dark it is between uh, the, the street lights versus that evenly lit light, uh, which is there because the lighting designers, the, the lighting team was very intentional about how they shielded that light and how they spread that light along the, the, the street. Uh, here's a great example. This is, this is down in Texas. These are both LED lights at, at the top there, uh, but those are, 80 watt unshielded blue bright LEDs. Uh, and then on the, the right, those are shielded, uh, again, LED bulbs, but they're at about 60% uh, savings on the electricity. And again, notice what's happened with uh, the, the shadows that you've uh, gotten rid of the shadows between the, those bright lights. Down on the bottom uh, left-hand side, that's a great example of, of, clay, uh, of glare, caused by all, all of that uh, clutter that, that we talked about. So glare and clutter. Um, here's a great example, just a parking lot. Um, so this is, uh, again, uh, before a retrofit, that light shining into your eyes, which is not where it needs to be. It needs to be down on, on the cars, on, on the pavement, and then the right-hand side, of, of course, afterwards. And who doesn't like going out and, and seeing your kids, your, your grandkids at the, the sports field? Uh, absolutely, that light on, on the left-hand side, why, why are those lights shining into your eyes as uh, a, a member sitting up in uh, the, the bleachers there? That light isn't doing your eyes any good. Instead, put that light where it actually belongs, where you meant for it to be, on the playing pitch, on, on the ball, on the opposing players. Put that light where it belongs and not in your eyes and, and save all of that energy. This is a great local example. This is up on, on Duluth, um, Superior Street there. Uh, you can see on, on the left-hand side, this is kind of the, the before picture with light shining everywhere, 360. You've got a lot of glare. You've got a lot of clutter going on. On the right-hand side, I actually have to stop and, and look to see where the street lights are. They're actually here. Uh, and so you think about, uh, and, and again, look at that, that street. That is not a dimly lit street. We didn't ask people to go home and sit in the, the dark. We uh, just provided a better uh, lightscape environment by being intentional about how we're using light in, in the outdoor environment. So last slide, uh, next steps. What does this all, all mean? How do you then take this home and start to, to bring it to your city councils, your tribal councils? 
first adopt those five principles of responsible outdoor lighting. Uh, consider becoming an international dark sky community. There are a great number of good examples of lighting ordinances. We'll, we'll hear from Plymouth in, in a little bit. Uh, there are model lighting ordinances that are available that you can grab, download, and then uh, tweak them so that they, they fit your community. Uh, certainly apply LEED B3 MN and uh, Green Step City standards. Uh, best practices. Uh, you're probably familiar with that. Your your city engineers and lighting engineers are are if you aren't. Um, adopt the uh, Roland Manifesto. Start asking your contractors whether they are a Roland certified or are familiar with the, the Roland program and are applying that in in their activities. Support dark sky friendly businesses and organizations. It's really inexpensive to get started in astrotourism turn off your, your lights, provide a, a space where people can go out and enjoy the stars at, at night. Now you're an astrotourism destination. So it's it's little or no cost to get astrotourism off the ground. And from there, you, you can build in some, some more activities that are gonna support astrotourism. Uh, certainly support our indigenous cultures and reach out to us. Uh, we are an all volunteer 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, we don't charge anything for any of our services, and there's some ways that you can contact us. And again, I apologize for, for running long, but that's it from me. Thank you, Todd. Very good. <laughs> um, no, I really appreciate this. You know, this topic for me personally came um, of interest when I was in Flagstaff, Arizona last year. I did not know it was a dark sky certified community. And I remember walking around at night and being like, this is just so relaxing and different. And what is what is different? And then later finding out that, that oh, it's a dark sky community. They've put a lot of thought into um, their lighting, um, you know, policies, ordinances, practices, and it and it made a really big impression on me. So, um, no, I appreciate you sharing everything. Um, I'll pause here and see if there are any questions for Todd before we move on. We should have some time at the very end of today as well. Feel free to unmute yourself or put something in the chat. Todd, well, thank you very much. This is great. Uh, when you started, I was first thinking, uh, oh, wow, how about safety? How about this? How about that? But you answered them all, almost. Uh, almost, because uh, I think there's a debate about the beauty uh, of dark versus lighted sky. How about Las Vegas? How about uh, Disneyland? How about uh, Christmas lighted houses? Uh, some people go crazy, right? Uh, I like lights and I like the dark sky. I mean, the, you will find the supporters of both, I suppose. So now that your health issues uh, concerns, uh, that, that is a big, big thing. And I think, well, I would say lights are bad, but we all look at those stupid screens, right? I, I lost my sleep completely. So computers, cell phones, that's right. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that the iPhone and I'm sure Android have this night mode when light is reduced and, and, and it, it becomes more yellow than than white. Uh, what I really liked in your presentation is directed light. I think you call them shielded lights. Uh, uh, that That is, a, I, I, I immediately, as you were speaking at the beginning, I, I came up with an idea with, I guess I did not, I reinvented the, the wheel, you already have that. Uh, smart housing, smart uh, smart lights. My house is all smart, although it is all LED, but it is, yeah, I'm using those different uh, options and I sometimes like the white light, but then, but then, uh, yeah, in the evening I tell, hey Siri, make my room, you know, <laughs> a cinema theater and it, it's just magic. So I think this smart controls, the smart city, smart everything, that is a big deal. And I know City of Cloud put those uh, LED lights. Uh, I hope that they are the ones that you were talking about, the, the shielded ones. Um, and of course, energy saving and safety. I think it's these are these are big things. And uh, uh, LED does save your energy. But as as you mentioned, 
you're not against them, right? You just want them to use to be used right in the right way and uh, wisely and uh, the temperature, this and that, it's all important. Uh, congratulations, it's, it's great, uh, great uh, research. Uh, would you be willing to share the uh, the PowerPoint at all? Or uh, can, can we, can, would, would you mind uh, sending a copy or, I know there will be a video recording available, right, Kristen? Yep, we'll send the recording yeah. as well as the all of the slides that are shared and links that mm -hmm. are mentioned. Um, I'll get that to you. I won't make any promises about this week, but next week for sure. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you, Todd. Um, really appreciate it. I think you have so much to share. Um, and and I will say I really like the International Dark Sky Association website. There is so much information on there um, that we're trying to connect to and um, add into Green Step Best Practices. So Todd did a really nice um, overview that I put in the chat there to the link and we'll share afterwards with all of the best practices that relate to dark sky um, initiatives. So thank you, Todd, for sharing and um, also helping us do some research into how we can um, integrate this into Green Step sustainability efforts. Yeah, thank you. Um, OK, we're going to take a quick pause from Dark Sky conversation and um, invite Candace from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency to share about uh, the Green Corps host site opportunity that is here right now. So Candace, are you on? Yeah. I am. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the invitation for sharing. I am going to stay off camera. My apologies, but I am a bit under the weather thanks to my toddler. Uh, so I don't, yeah, I have my Kleenex not right next to me. So um, yeah, it allows me to, to sneak wipe if needed. But uh, can I get a thumbs up or some acknowledgement that y'all are seeing my screen all right? Awesome. Thanks, That's Todd. <clears throat> Tough act to follow, P.S. Okay, well, yes, once again, Kristen, thank you for the invitation. I'm here just to speak briefly about the Minnesota Green Corps program. We recently opened our host site application, so we want to get uh, the word out uh, that we are currently accepting uh, applications from host site organizations, so educational institutions, nonprofit, state agencies, and tribal communities about uh, the possibility of hosting a Minnesota Green Corps member next program year. So if you haven't heard about Minnesota Green Corps, uh, we are an AmeriCorps program coordinated by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency with a mission to help preserve and protect Minnesota's environment while training the next generation of environmental professionals. So how the program kind of works, uh, members uh, sign up, or they apply to and are selected to serve in our program. It is a full-time 11-month AmeriCorps service term. So members serve from mid-September to mid-August, about 1,700 hours over that time frame. And we basically pair a Minnesota Green Corps member with each of those host site organizations. So host sites apply and are selected to host a Minnesota Green Corps member. And then that member serves with that organization for the 11-month time frame, helping that organization roll out environmental stewardship best practices, projects, um, and help the organization grow capacity. Host site, host site organizations apply and have projects that members complete in one of these four what we call topic or focus areas. So projects could focus on air pollutant reduction. Those include some green transportation focused initiatives or energy conservation, public building retrofits or lighting initiatives, for example. Projects could also focus on community readiness and outreach, uh, educating students, community residents, and so on about environmentally uh, conscious best practices. Projects could focus on waste reduction, recycling, and organics management, or last but not least, green infrastructure improvements, which include both forestry and stormwater focused initiatives. In order to be eligible for to host a Minnesota Green Corps member, organizations must either be government entities, so city, county, regional, state, tribal, uh, soil and water conservation districts, and so on, school districts, 501c3 nonprofits, or not-for-profit institutions of higher education. We do anticipate selecting 
47 hosted organizations to host a Minnesota Green Corps member next program year, once again, starting mid-September. So we do not require fee for service. So the Minnesota Green Corps program through MPCA, we pay uh, the member stipend, we provide the member with health insurance, we cover workers' compensation. So we do not, we're not a cash match program. There's no partner support or fee for service uh, required. However, we do require in-kind match. So we have a federal AmeriCorps grant and we do require that host that organizations provide in-kind match in the form of operating costs so that they provide an office space, computer, internet telephone for the members serving on site. They provide supervisor time of approximately four hours per week. So they identify an individual at their organization that's going to be the primary point of contact and offer support, including you know, project specific guidance and additional training so that the member is uh, equipped to carry out that project. They provide uh, materials and funds for members to implement those project activities. And finally, we do expect the host site organization to budget $300 for a member to participate in trainings, webinars, conferences, or events. So we are a professional development program. So while our members are doing great things, building capacity, implementing environmental work at those host site organizations, we are also a training program and have that training component. So we really do uh, lean on that host site organization to provide that $300 budget in addition to exposure uh, to different um, individuals in the environmental profession and other trainings as uh, they come up. And then a little bit about the impact that uh, our Minnesota Green Corps members make. So a couple of stats from last year and our outputs and outcomes. Uh, last year, our about 48 Minnesota Green Corps members um, implemented retrofits on 25 public buildings for energy savings, installed or received commitments to install 25 electric vehicle charging stations, prevented 833 tons of waste from being landfilled, improved 80 acres of public lands, inventoried about 1,700 trees, planted 2,400 trees, mobilized almost 850 volunteers, and our, and our uh, big, big accomplishment is uh, that Minnesota Green Corps members educated or engaged over 12,000 uh, community members and individuals. So a couple of project examples. Uh, so on the left, you'll see um, We'll see Monica, Amelia, Will, and Kelsey uh, that served at Leech Lake, Band of Ojibwe, Prairie Island, City of Roseville, and City of Winona, respectively. And all of these four members that I'm highlighting today um, did had project that projects that included STEM Green Step aligned initiatives. So we've had members in the past uh, work on. Uh, public building, energy use data, entering data, um, uploading data into B3. Uh, we've had members before identify and implement public building retrofits, uh, including some, um, uh, some lighting, conduct fleet inventory to right size fleet, reduce vehicle miles traveled through uh, establishing vehicle sharing, encouraging trip bundling, encouraging biking or public transit, improving smart salting by reducing chloride use, uh, members can help uh, an organization complete the municip municipal stormwater management assessment. Members can conduct tree inventory or uh, canopy studies on public trees, coordinate residential source separated organics collection. And as you saw from our, our uh, previous output number, about 20,000 individuals engaged uh, Minnesota Green Corps members can help an organization uh, by delivering public education and helping to engage the next generation of um, folks in your community. So application materials are available on our website. Thank you for putting that in the chat, Kristen. Uh, so on our website, if you want to check out, check it out, we have some uh, general information about the Minnesota Green Corps program and then specific to the application, we have an application guide. Uh, it's a 20 page document that includes important information about applying and includes information about the program in general. Um, and some um, it includes uh, information about our four pre scoped uh, positions and some of those activities that in air pollutant reduction, community readiness and outreach, waste reduction, or green infrastructure improvement that the Minnesota Green Corps member could engage in. We uh, have a short host site application form 
Those applications are due on uh, by my March 14th at 5 p.m. Um, they can be submitted to that email address, which I will put in the chat uh, after this session as well. Questions can also be fielded, um, will be fielded uh, when sent to that Minnesota Green Corps email. And then also on the website for your reference, we have a couple of sample work plans and a sample Minnesota Green Corps host site agreement that we do expect the host site organization, if selected, uh, to sign. And then I'll close with a couple of application tips. We have found uh, that projects that include about three primary projects and maybe one supplemental activity are the most successful. So they provide a diverse, robust experience for the Minnesota Green Corps member. Um, and so it's an enjoyable and productive experience for both the host site organization and the member when working on those projects. We do require alignment with at least one of our performance measures. Uh, those are listed in the application guide and on the application. So those include reducing energy use, improving water quality, uh, waste reduction, and individual uh, education. Community engagement component is also encouraged and prioritized. We do have a preference for, um, for projects that focus on in or around an environmental justice area of concern. We encourage projects to account for seasonality. This is especially with green infrastructure improvement projects uh, that maybe it might be difficult to obviously do some uh, stormwater rain garden work in the winter. So please uh, factor that in when building out your work plan. We do um, post COVID, we actually uh, do encourage that host sites allow members to teleserve one to two days per week. Um, this obviously is best practice for reducing vehicle miles traveled and also uh, creates a, a little more equitable experience for our Minnesota Green Corps members. Uh, so we, we look to host that organization that have the capacity to allow members to teleserve. And then obviously the most important uh, application tip is to please submit your application um, by the application deadline of March 14th at 5 p.m. Any questions, like I said before, can be directed to our Minnesota Green Corps email. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram. We are promoting a lot of great uh, projects, uh, highlighting the great work that our Minnesota Green Corps members do over the 11 month service term. And with that, uh, our, I don't know if we have time for any questions, if folks have any questions. Otherwise, I'll, yeah, I'll stand in line for a couple of minutes, but I appreciate, once again, the opportunity to share. Thank you. Thanks, Candace. Hope you're feeling better uh, and it doesn't continue to, to spread across the family. Um, so yeah, <laughs> we, we are behind time on our schedule, so um, I do want to move along, but if there are questions, you can put things in the chat. Candace will see them um, and, or send it question to the email and we'll send um, links and, and everything uh, afterwards with you all as well. So, okay, well, let's jump back into the, to our topic. Um, and we're going to uh, dive into a little bit more around astrotourism and hear from Nick with Visit Cook County. So Nick, I think you're going to share your screen. I'm going to try here and <laughs> get this to work. Uh, I'm working off of one monitor, uh, so let's see if I can get this to function. So I don't know if I'm going to have the same issue as Todd did when we were testing out. Uh, is that showing full presentation? Nope. Yep. Probably same issue. Same issue. Well, I'm with one monitor here. I'm not sure how to work around that exactly. Ooh, I can't jump question. out of presenter mode to then reshare. Okay. So alternatively, I can share. Um, or you can just share in not presenter mode. Nick, are you on a Windows machine? I am, yes. What you could try would be going into full screen mode uh, before you start sharing. And then if you hold down Alt and, and hit Tab, that will cycle you through all of your different screens. And then you can get to the screen that says Share. And 
then I'll tab back to your, your display. Look Good tip. The, thank you, Todd. <laughs> he knows a lot more than just lights and dark sky <laughs> stuff. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, happy to be here to kind of continue this conversation. I'll try and move quick uh, through some of these slides here. But uh, I, as mentioned, I'm Nick. I'm events marketing manager for Visico County, uh, Visico County. Uh, up all the way in the northeastern uh, corner of our state, the rest of our, our team and our staff there at Visica County just have the privilege of working with some very talented people uh, that do a great job up up there. Um, a little bit more about our organization quickly. Visica County is a collaboration of existing community tourism associations uh, and uh, Cook County Events and Visitors Bureau, uh, voluntary members of Grand Portage, Band of Chippewa, Ojibwe, and Lutzen Mountains, uh, and the existing tourism organizations that have existed much longer than Visica County, uh, the Gunflint Trail Association, Grand Marais Area Tourism Association, Lutzen Tofty Schroeder Tourism Association as well. And uh, those, those three organizations still exist and we work with them uh, kind of by design to bring us all together for the betterment of of the whole region. Um, for Visica County, our mission is to enhance, enhance and grow a sustainable tourism economy in Cook County. And uh, vision is for Visica County to provide solutions to tourism and visitor related interests of the region. And looking at that, just want to kind of mention, uh, obviously big tie into to the conversation here today, that first, that first part, the mission, uh, sustainable tourism. I think um, there's been different perception of of what that is, what that means over time. Um, right now, by definition from the, um, the World Tourism Organization, there, there's sort of a, a tripod when it comes to sustainable tourism. And that's uh, the economic aspect, which obviously has been a big focal point of, of tourism and, and lodging tax that su supports tourism. Uh, but then there's environmental and, uh, and socio-cultural as well. And uh, really when you, when you dive into it and have a full understanding of how connected they all are, uh, that without without focusing on one, without nurturing one of those tripod legs, uh, obviously the whole thing falls over. And so seeing that more and more and more, um, historically organizations like Visica County, uh, whether it's an individual uh, community level, uh, county level, even state level, like Explore Minnesota, the term uh, DMO, which stands has historically kind of represented destination marketing organization, has kind of shifted more to destination management and marketing organization and uh and that's uh because there's a lot more than just just marketing when it comes to uh what organizations like ours do uh for our destinations uh and when you look at sustainable tourism it kind of becomes a little bit more clearly uh, why that is um then i just want to touch on events in general in, in cook county um Per Minnesota state statute, uh, destinations can enact the 3% lodging tax at, at any time. Um, and, and they can have that kind of, as long as they wish, 95% uh, of that has to be spent on, on tourism marketing promotion. Um, in 2008, special legislation was passed specifically for Cook County uh, to on top of that 3% to have an additional 1% lodging tax. Uh, and this was dedicated uh, use, uh, the intent of it was to support uh, events and programs within Cook County. And uh, it's kind of a um, uh, something that is unique to Cook County, but that's in part because there's an understanding of how critical the tourism economy is to Cook County. If you've ever been up uh, all the way to Cook County, uh, Grand Marais, Gunflint Trail, those beautiful areas, uh, it's not hard to see that majority of our, our um, our economy is is based on on tourism, and so this really helps us leverage that a little bit more. Um, and it's uh, kind of an answer too, because we don't have a major event facility like a lot of destinations do. Um, uh, and a side note that uh, special legislation, uh, because it's special legislation, um, that does not have kind of a, a no sunset and. Uh, that's scheduled to sunset later this year, and we were at the Capitol last year trying to renew that, and uh, obviously tax bill did not did not come out of that session last year, and so hopeful to renew that so we can continue to have that great support to a long list of events and programs around Cook County. Um, so just want to touch on um, uh, something Todd already kind of hit on is uh, as a tourism destination, especially one that is a 
a drive destination that has drastic season changes. Um, we uh, put a priority on trying to drive traffic in our shoulder seasons. Uh, probably not much of a surprise that uh, that Cook County and our and our communities do uh, do well for the most part, uh, with with some exceptions, whether it's certain areas that are pandemic related, uh, but obviously do very, very well in uh, in the summertime and, and kind of peak season. Uh, but trying to, to drive more visitors in the shoulder season when businesses need them, uh, that only allows businesses to um, potentially hold on to their employees longer, be able to, to pay them, keep them around longer, trying to extend that tourism economy to, to be more year round as possible. Um, and so, uh, as a part of that, we obviously do a lot of things that that help focus on that. But as a part of that, we have created these branded seasons, uh, waterfall season uh, happening in April and May, uh, which is a wonderful time to come visit if you never have. Uh, obviously, we we get a lot of snow in Cook County. And so kind of uh, the aftermath of of the runoff and, and waterfalls is a pretty incredible time to to take some hikes and, and go see some beautiful waterfalls in, in Cook County. And we, we have a lot, including the, the uh, highest waterfall in the state, of course, up in Grand Portage, uh, and the High Falls at Grand Portage State Park. Um, but then we also have storm season we created, uh, which really kind of falls in the November timeframe, highlighting just the, the gales of November, if you will, and kind of uh, what, what comes off of Lake Superior that time of the year. But then we also have dark sky season, which uh, is uh, focused really on the winter time. If, uh, if anyone knows uh, really that dark sky season is truly uh, is kind of year round, uh, but obviously it, it makes sense to promote it a little more heavily in the wintertime just because we have longer nights. Uh, and so it's just a, a great opportunity to kind of uh, focus on that when we need those visitors more. Um, we've seen really great engagement with dark sky content, um, and we know that Northern Lights is, is a bucket list item for a lot of folks too. So. Um, and I kind of mentioned this again here, but that was just a natural progression from uh, creating the the branded seasons into looking at creating a, a festival. And so, um, why why create a dark sky festival? Well, uh, as mentioned, uh, immense quality of dark skies in Cook County um, that was known uh, well before the Boundary Waters became a, a, a dark sky sanctuary. Uh, obviously, there's there's a lot more terms and knowledge now of, of what's going on, what's happening, but um, you know, as long as uh, our area has been a destination for for people to recreate outdoors, uh, to travel, um, they know that uh, that seeing the night sky and seeing the breathtaking stars and the boundary waters or what have you is is a big piece of of what they uh, what they take away. Um, and then there's cultural significance. Uh, Grand Portage is uh, one of the communities that is a part of our destination, and so uh, understanding that's important to the culture of of um, the, the people of Grand Portage uh, and trying to make sure that that's a part of, uh, of our festival, really our, our brand of our destination, but extending that through our festival. Uh, and then engagement, like I said, with the content, uh, Northern Lights continues to be a bucket list item. Rise of Astral Tourism, which I'll touch on a little bit more and Todd has already as well. Uh, we've just recognized that we've seen that. I will share a great link to a Washington Post article from late 2021 that really does a great job kind of uh, talking about the rise of astral tourism. Uh, what it can do from an economic standpoint, what it can do to to drive uh, really what uh, uh, we'll call a high quality visitor. And that's something that we really try and focus on is um, I think there's a perception that um, destination organizations are just trying to, uh, you know, promote and, and you know, uh, just grab a megaphone and, and, and shout. But we try and be more strategic than that and uh, and really focus on uh attracting the right kind of visitor and obviously uh, when you think of the goal being sustainable tourism want someone that's going to check the boxes of course from an economic standpoint uh but also that uh supports those environmental initiatives uh kind of adds to the to the fabric of your uh socio and cultural uh, aspects of your destination as well um and of course uh the international dark sky association starry skies uh they uh launched their first celebrate the night sky week in 2017 and so obviously paying attention to what was going on there visit cook county uh, kind of followed after that and launched the first dark sky festival in 2018. and so again todd kind of touched on this but here's kind of a, 
a definition. There's there's multiple out there, but astrotourism is any kind of tourism that involves night sky visiting facilities related to astronomy, like uh, observatories, combining that with a broader sense of ecotourism, where interaction with nature is what the visitor experience is about. Um, so really, uh, it's it's something that people can engage with at any point of the year. Um, it's something that um, we see uh, drives people to uh, more likely have an overnight stay. Obviously, if they're if they're staying out late and engaging with night sky, then they're more likely to to book lodging and stay within the destination. Um, oftentimes, um, there's indications that uh, the folks that uh, that enjoy this type of activity also have might have some disposable income, which is is a good thing for attracting certain visitors. Um, but then we see. Um, this kind of bleed out everywhere too throughout our our events world and like i'm talking about with the dark sky festival being a big priority for us uh, we also are uh, we have two stops on the dark sky caravan which is a, a event every year that the um, the planetarium out of the university of minnesota duluth hosts and does different stops and, and programs up the north shore um, just this upcoming weekend uh, chickwalk um, museum and nature center which they close for the season but they are hosting a dark sky event uh, mid gun gunflint trail this weekend um, you also see uh, uh, hotels and, and different lodging establishments getting more uh, into the theme kind of doing thematic packages and really highlighting opportunities to uh, to um, uh, engage with the night sky and then even other events that aren't focused on this you start to see things uh, creep in the more the more we make it a priority um, like uh, we have a fat bike winter uh, biking event and um, and they have uh, a night ride that they're incorporating that they're gonna uh, they're considering just labeling as a, as a dark sky ride so um, fun fun things like that come out of it as well but I will share that article which is a, a great resource um, as mentioned um, we launched the first dark sky festival before uh, the boundary waters became a dark sky sanctuary so this was all in motion but this really obviously brought a lot of attention uh, to um, to dark sky places, to astrotourism, uh, and really highlighted Minnesota as it is uh, uh, the cream of the crop. It is the, uh, as Todd mentioned, the, the largest dark sky sanctuary and sanctuaries being um, being the, the top of the line, the most premier dark sky places in the world. And so uh, we're very blessed to have this this resource and, and it's a big part of what drives the economy for, for Cook County. Uh, important asset for us. And so, um, you know, great, great opportunity to really share that story. And, and again, although that designation is new, uh, what, what it's talking about, the product, the night sky is not, and that's been around for a long, long time. So uh, a lot of people know it, but it was a great opportunity to continue to kind of um, make people think about the Boundary Waters in a different way. Maybe they have never thought about uh, the night experience they can have there versus uh, versus just canoeing or paddling. Um, and then kind of a recognition of all of this is, as we've gained momentum and steam from everything that uh, that uh, Star Skies North has done, us doing a festival, uh, the work from uh, different partnerships around the region that have brought the, the dark sky places uh, in, in the North uh, Northland. Uh, at the end of 2021, National Geographic came out with Best of the World, 25 Amazing Journeys for 2022, and Northern Minnesota was was one of those listed. So, listed as one of the the you know top 25 things to do in the year in the world. And that, as you can see by that little uh, clip there from the article, is uh, all all based on uh, the the night sky. So, pretty amazing uh, and and great recognition for. Kind of the work that's been been done to to preserve that and as far as our our dark sky festival uh it's still young and growing and uh and getting people up to cook county in december uh, obviously has its challenges it's uh we've strategically picked what is historically a very quiet weekend trying to build some sh shoulder season traffic uh at that time of the year as we mentioned um but it, it's definitely gained in popularity. And we know too that a lot of people engage with the content uh, and that might inspire them to come at a different time of the year to, to come see our night skies. Um, but uh, it's evolved a lot from the first year to this year. And this just this past December, uh, we, uh, on a very limited budget, we were able to have uh, NASA come and do some presentations. That's a NASA presentation, that image there. Uh, NASA did a couple of presentations and activity. 
Uh, we had a um, presentation and book signing by astrotourism author Valerie Stemmack, which was fantastic. Uh, recommend uh, looking for her book. It's Lonely Planets, Dark Skies, Practical Guide to Astrotourism. I think my little screen is still available somewhere on the screen, but holding up the book there. Um, we were really lucky uh, that we were able to, uh, the timing just sort of worked out that we were able to have some of the initial uh, screenings of a brand new document documentary, uh, Northern Night Starry Skies, which uh, which featured our local photographer, Travis Nowitzki, who's a, a part of the uh, the Cook County sub subcommittee of, of Starry Skies North, uh, but is an extremely, extremely talented night sky photographer and a very engaged uh, kind of member of, of the dark sky movement um and then lot, lots of other things uh, weather didn't work out but usually we'll have a uh, night sky walk uh, we'll have uh, some telescope viewing opportunities star party um, all kinds of great stuff and it continues to evolve more and more and uh, and there's more synergy now between uh, the new starry skies local committee um, in cook county as well as uh, some of the other partner organizations and there's uh Kind of a collection of some logos there that represent different partners that that help make that festival possible um, which we're really really um, lucky to have uh, folks that are so um, willing to invest in in this but they also i think uh, they see the potential in in astro tourism and, and what it can really do um, not just benefiting businesses economically but uh, dispersing people around the county uh, cook county is 90 percent public land so you in case you weren't aware, you, you pretty much own a, uh, a whole county uh, as a, a, a resident of Minnesota. Um, but that just means that there's there's endless places to explore, endless places to go look at the night sky, uh, and it allows people to go engage in different areas of Cook County instead of maybe just those popular trailheads where a lot of people or traffic bottles up, and that's an important part of, of what we're trying to focus on as well. And there's the dates for our 2023 festival. So um, you can mark your calendars and come on up to, to Cook County. Thank you, Nick. Uh, I want to come, so <laughs> you'll be there. Uh, you'll Maybe I'll see you there. Um, I know I, I missed it uh, this last year, but definitely was trying to follow along with all of the events and activities that were and the news that was coming out um, around everything at, with the festival so um, really exciting um, and great to have the area up there um, really engaged in this so uh, we are still short on time which is totally fine still enough time for Kip to share um, but I'm gonna uh, ask that and if there's any questions or comments if they get put it in the chat or um, followed up afterwards so that we can um, hear from Kip and a little bit more on um, you know the the um, the implementation of, of some of this that we're talking about at uh, the city level so um, Kip with the city of Plymouth. I think you're going to share your screen and slides. Yeah, I may have the same issue. Um, let's see if we can okay. get, this, get this going <laughs> here. Um, does that seem to be working? No, not presentation mode. How about that? Same issue. Hmm. What was your trick, Todd? Yeah, put it so, in presentation mode. Right. So, so first put it in presentation mode, and then if you've got a single screen, you can toggle through your different tabs by just holding down the Alt key and then hitting Tab, and then that'll get you back to uh, the Microsoft Teams screen where you can say share screen, and then that, that'll that'll solve it. Oh my gosh. Ta -da. That, seemed, that seemed to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Score. All right. Well, um, thanks for the opportunity today. And um, I would say that the city of Plymouth is not quite an astro tourism destination yet. But um, in hearing Todd speak, I think it makes me think that Plymouth is heading in the right direction when it comes to exterior lighting regulations. Um, but I do 
think that there's still some some work to do. So um, with that, I guess I'll just briefly talk about um, the City of Plymouth Exterior Lighting Ordinance and kind of how we've gotten to where we are today. Um, in 2004, the City of Plymouth worked with um, Nancy Clanton and Associates, and I know that um, Nancy Clanton was one of the chief authors of the um, model lighting ordinance um, through the International Dark Sky Association. And when it was adopted, um, it brought, it was, the idea was to improve lighting regulations in the city, in particular in areas where homes bordered commercial and industrial development. Um, and what it did was it created lighting zones, um, and it also created um, total site lighting lumens. Um, and that seemed to be working until a lot of, you know, the, um, the LED technology came out. So in 2013, the city um, approved a revised ordinance, again working with um, Nancy Clanton and Associates on trying to get um, the lighting re related regulations in line with the current lighting technology. And by doing that, it is basically looking at the um, use of lumens versus watts. Um, also created a number of different um, definitions that I don't think um, I'll just say the common person is used to. So this is showing the the definitions that were added to the definition section of the ordinance under lighting related. Um, as you can see, a number of these are probably definitions that the, the general person isn't aware of. So we had to define all of these that you see here because those are words that are used in the, the lighting ordinance and it tries to clarify some of the things that the ordinance is getting at. Um, you know, some of those things that um, that we heard Todd talk about, you know, we talked about the, the color rendering index, the correlated color temperature. Those are things that I was never aware of until this ordinance was was adopted. And again, it's it's something that I think is is needed and helpful for for people to see how the ordinance works. Um, and also, as I mentioned, it created a lighting zone map. Um, and as you can see here, the lighting zone map um, goes from LZ light zone zero to light zone three. Um, point of clarification, to this day, Plymouth still does not have an LZ three um, that's required to go through a process, a public hearing process um, through condition use permit to get to that. It goes above and beyond what's allowed in the LZ two. Um, the moderate ambient lighting. Um, the moderate amb ambient lighting areas are areas you see along the major roadways, along the commercial and industrial properties. Um, so it's, and then the, the LZ1, the low ambient lighting are your residential settings. Um, and then ultimately we do have some LZ0, which are um, no ambient lighting, which are some of the city open spaces and um, to be honest with you, those areas are slowly disappearing within the city of Plymouth as it becomes more fully developed. Um, so the table does try to distinguish, distinguish the differences between those lighting zones. And as you will see, there's a different level of lighting allowed within those areas as we work, work through it. Um, it also created maximum lighting mount, mounting heights within those, those light zones. So, you know, as I mentioned in 2004, there was a change and prior to 2004, and there may be a number of ordinances out there that still look at it this way. Um, staff had determined accessible lighting levels on a site on the basis of foot candle readings at either a property line or center line of a public street, whichever applied. The new way to look at it is to look at um, each lighting application or each fixture. So what I mentioned in 2013, the lumens per hardscape allowance versus um, foot candles or watts per square feet. It's it's the to try and ex explain it um, as simple as possible is the lighting contractor establishes an area of hardscape. Um, that's the permanent hardscape improvements to the site, parking lot, drives, entrances, curbs, ramps, stairs. So they establish a square footage of, of that area on the site. And depending on what light zone the property is in, so a lot of the times we're talking about commercial 
and industrial applications. So they're allowed to go to 2.5 lumens per square foot of hardscape. So it, I mean, it does basically become a math exercise. So just like, for example, if you have 20,000 square feet of hardscape, they're allowed to have up to 50,000 lumens. And that is something that we look at in, in great detail and they're, they're need, they need to show that they do not exceed those allowable lumens on the property. The other part in 2013 that I think was, was um, I think it was a great improvement in addition to the ordinance as we talked about the backlight, uplight and glare. And I know that Todd also talked about, you know, some of those slides that he showed, some of the, the light that the glare when you're looking and you see that you see it, it just is very just, you know, not not attractive to the, the human eye. And that's what these um, regulations try to try to keep the light from escaping the fixture. It, it basically requires the light to go down to the parking lot as opposed to anywhere off the property. Uh, the uplight, um, you can see that the uplight is very heavily regulated. Um, and not allowed to escape the fixture up into the night to the night sky. And then finally, as I mentioned, the glare is also um, limited. Um, as you can see, they are allowed to go a little bit higher, but in those cases, the, the mounting needs to be either away from the property line or ideally oriented, um, basically um, meaning that it needs to be mounted at, at a 90 degree. So you're, you're really working on light not escaping the fixture. Um, the other part is to establish maximum CCT. Um, I can say that there has been discussion based on that 2016 article um, regarding street lights and trying to limit fixtures to 3000 Kelvin. As you can see, Plymouth has still allows up to 4100 K. Um, there was some discussion after that 2016 article to go forward and try and limit our fixtures to 3000. Um, that has not yet happened, so um, you can see that we do have contractors coming in with the with the 4,000 K fixtures, which you can definitely see the difference between the 4,000 and the 3,000 K. And I also can say that lighting contractors are all, who aren't used to working with the dark sky requirements um, try to um, consistently um, request fixtures that are 5,000 K and are, are very very white and bright, um, as you know, Todd explained explained in some good detail there. Um, we also did require and, and put in lighting controls, um, depending on what light zone it is. There are curfew requirements, um, as you can see, for example, in the LZ2, it's the latter of, of 10 p.m. or the close of business, um, and those are requirements with, with few exceptions um, for the for the walkway and stair areas. It did maintain the shielding requirements of properties of any re residential properties within 300 feet are required to have shielding requirements. Um, we did look in the former or in the previous ordinance of more sh shielding requirement related. Now those are strictly to the to the residential and I think the new fixtures achieve those um, naturally shielding. Um, so, and then also it did maintain the enforcement if if we do receive a complaint from a resident or something along those lines, um, the the fixture, the applicant is required to show that they are meeting these football, excuse me, football, the foot candle requirements at the at the property line. Um, just to talk about where it's at from a from a lighting contractor um, concern, I, I can say that there was a um, kind of a there was a work in progress, if you will, from when this with the ordinance was adopted to to where we're at today. Um, we had lighting contractors say, "Well, we can't meet we can't meet your ordinance. It's too restrictive. Um, we can't even light our our parking lot to a level of safety. It's it's not safe." Um, so we actually have had as you can see this in yellow the stamp on on lighting plans where the lighting contractor feels so adamant that it's not not up to their to their level of lighting um, they say that it is insufficient does not recommend these levels for security and safety reasons um, 
So I think that's that's where the learning curve comes in with, with trying to have staff work with the lighting contract contractors and say that it's it's lighting differently than than what you are you're used to. It may not feel as it's safe, but it's lighting lighting better and more. You know, focusing the light as opposed to spilling the light is it was is really the intent of the ordinance. So I, I would say that it's getting better. Um, the lighting contractors are becoming more aware of not only the dark sky association's requirement, but Plymouth's requirement. I think Bloomington has some of the some of the same um, rules and regulations when it comes to exterior lighting. And I think there are a lot more fixtures that they can provide that that meet ordinance requirements. Um, and with that, we're starting to see lighting plans. This is just an example of a lighting plan that comes in. Um, it does still contain the foot candles, but it also has a number of different, um, you know, you see other details within the lighting plan itself with these tables. Um, I know that those are hard to read, but I did zoom in on a couple on this next slide. Um, so they, you can see here that the lighting contractor clearly established that there's a the amount of hardscape within the area. They showed the amount of lumens that they can have per square feet of allowance. It, it established a maximum amount of initial lumens and they were able to show through their fixtures that they would not exceed that. Um, so you can see the lumens are listed per per fixture. They also showed on here specifically the bug ratings, uh, the backlight, uplight and glare. Um, these are not common details that we would see, I would say, from from a from a short period of time between 2013 when it was adopted for a handful of years. It was really a struggle to get the lighting contractors to provide this level of detail on the lighting plan. But I guess my my response is that it has gotten better and they are coming becoming a lot more used to um, how the Plymouth ordinance works. And I think I think it's an example of how you can slowly start to to improve lighting within your within your community. Um, it also require it also has the actual fixture details right within the lighting plan where we can look up and find you know the CRI requirement, the CCT, making sure that they're not trying to slip 5,000 K fixtures in there, um, and making sure that they're they're you know living with the with the requirements. And with that, we're getting the these plans that are showing the lights that it's keeping the light on site. It's not. It's doing the best to try and keep light from spilling beyond it. Um, you know, these are things that that we're seeing that I think are some level of success. And slowly but surely, some of our sites are are getting into this. All our new sites, obviously, um, any redevelopment site, and then also any site that that replaces beyond 50% of their fixtures, they are required to come into compliance with the with the current ordinance. So that is all that I had today, and I hope it gives a, a brief um, example of how Plymouth is is able to show some some success when it comes to lighting regulations. Thanks, Kip. I think that yeah, really puts it into like how to you know how do we take all of what we've learned today and put it into actual like you know, reality of how how we make this shift um, in our communities. And, and I think, you know, part of that is is education and sharing um, and, you know, building astrotourism and, you know, the, the why, but also, you know, the regulation piece of it um, and, and understanding. So I really appreciate your perspective on that. Um, I do acknowledge that we are at time. So if those of you that need to hop off, um, please do. Otherwise, um, we will certainly, um, I'll share contact information for each of you if, if folks have questions that we didn't get to today um, or if some come up uh, uh, later. And, um, you know, I definitely think, um, thank you, Todd, Nick, and Kip for really great presentations in on this topic. I think we could have kept talking about it today and learned a lot more from each of you. Um, so thank you for sharing your time. And, and your expertise and experiences. So um, with that, I think I'll let everyone go and we'll follow up with, again, the recording, slides, links, all of that good stuff um, for everyone later this week or next. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all, thanks again.